allow me to rant about the case high drives. A lot of people think the world of these tractors. Oh man, that's a 446, that's a 448. Oh, those big cases. Yeah, they got big tires, cool. Big engine, big tires. I need to change the effing starter. And you gotta take this whole tractor apart to change the starter. A starter is one of the most common failures of anything, any freaking engine on the face of the earth. A starter, alternator, water pump. These should all be easily serviced. You have to take the hood off. The freaking oil cooler shroud work has to come off here and here. The exhaust pipes have to come off. Then this fan cover has to come off. But to do that, you have to pull this, this fan or if it was all together, this would have a clutch, uh, you know, a mower deck clutch on it. You have to pull all of that stuff off just to get to these stupid bolts in the front of the starter. Like they couldn't have manufactured a removable section right here to save you a day of labor. I'm so aggravated right now with you, Onan, you jerks. You know what? These machines should be cut up because they suck other than the axles. The front rocker wears out, the steering sucks, the cab is cramped, only a scrawny guy can fit in this damn thing. Look at this fender in the way. I mean, how much room do I need to get my leg in if I'm a 400 pound guy? Quite a bit more than that. <clears throat> God, I'm aggravated right now. To sort of put a conclusion, a more calm-headed conclusion on my rant yesterday, when I was just fed up and I was pretty furious at this machine yesterday, so maybe not my best form. But to wrap this up for anybody who's looking at these case high drives, I already mentioned the operator compartment is very small. That fender skirt is in there. I mean, to get on this machine, you really have to step on and swing this leg completely over the top. Coming, coming through here, it's, it's just a tight, not a good feel through the knees trying to maneuver into that machine. It's a small compartment. If you've got a big gut, it's going to be right up against that steering wheel. There's no option to slide the seat that I'm aware of. The big thing that to me is unacceptable is the design of the steering. Now, this is how much play the machine has side to side. Uh, actually, before there's any motion in the tires. So this is what I've got for motion before there's any response in any of the parts up front. But look at the rocking in the axle. So it's bad enough, but not a, not a big deal that these ball joint ends wear out. That's, that's acceptable because they're easy to get at. Let's call it a maintenance item. You know, if your tie rod ball end wears out, I mean, they don't have grease fittings, so it's not like you can blame the owner for lack of maintenance. And I don't know how many hours they last because these garden tractors don't have hour meters, but it's not the end of the world to just change those out. Okay, we'll call replacing those tie rod ends maintenance. But this section here is a whole different matter. There's a grease fitting on the top that you really cannot get to, okay? And then it's got this pin system that goes through, and that pin, don't get me wrong, the diameter of the pin is fine. It's a whopper, probably an inch and a quarter pin, and it's got a, a, a securement right through there through this retaining bolt. But it's just drilled through these two thin pieces of plate, and there's no bushing sleeve, so they spread apart. Now watch this axle. Watch how much this thing moves. And this is with no engine. It rocks and lifts the frame off the ground. I know you can't tell it, but the frame is rising toward the camera with that steering effort. So if you've got a snow plow on and the engine and the hood and you know all this weight on the front end, and then you've got a snow plow up in the air and you're trying to turn, the force required, you first have to lift the machine before you get any responsiveness from the wheels. <clears throat> now, that force, this requires a tremendous amount of force into this rod. And into that rod, it comes through. Let's see if I can get in. That rod comes through this little gearbox. Right straight down in here, you're going to see the steering shaft there and that gear on the end with a bushing. And yeah, there's a grease fitting, but you can't get to it. You can't get to it. You don't even know it's there. Look at the amount of slop. Look at this. 
Well, you didn't grease the thing. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't get to the grease fitting to do so without tearing the engine out. And getting the engine out is an all-day affair. So, with this much slop, that pinion gear, and this real simple little rack piece down in here, they all wear out. So the teeth just turn to nubbins. And then you can get to where the thing is just jumping over. The steering arm is just terrible. I guess that's the shortest way to put it. For a variety of reasons. And none of them are really... I can't say none of them are the owner's fault because there are grease fittings, but... Is it reasonable to expect a person to dismantle a machine to grease it? I mean, you don't have to unbolt the hood and pull the valve covers to check your oil, do you? No. So, I'm just disappointed in what these machines cost. And, you know, they look like badass machines. That's got the tallest tires you're going to find. I mean, those are 26 by 12s. Those are 30-something inch tires. They dwarf you know, a case high drive dwarfs what's on a regular Bowens, Deer, Cub, Aaron's, Sears Suburban. It dwarfs it. This thing looks like a big bear of a machine. <clears throat> but it's not going to live any longer, even though they might have costed more. It's not going to live any longer than any other for its flaws. And in fact, the Deer design... This is a Deer 140, and I'm very, very fond of these machines. Yes, there is slop in the machine, but it's just a different situation. There is a steering box in this. I have never opened one up before. I'm going to go through this machine as well and see about renewing this and, and seeing is there adjustability in it. It just doesn't have the same, it doesn't require the same effort. That thing is hard to steer with just a snow plow in the air. I built a hydraulic grapple that picks up logs, saw logs. And I can still steer it. You, you're, I'd never be able to steer the case. Now the next issue that I take up with these cases is that instead of using hydrostatic drive, they use hydraulic drive. A hydraulic gear pump on these is a fixed gear pump. And I understand why they did it. One, they don't want to pay big money for hydrostatic pumps, you know, off the shelf. You can buy a gear pump really affordably. And what they did was they engineered a valve that modulates better than your typical directional control valve by putting little detent notches in. But I have never felt good about it. So there's each one of these little lines is like a little click on this control valve. Now, hydra hydraulic control valves underneath, but you have to maintain. I don't know if you can see it. I'm, I mean, I'm holding the camera like on the ground. You really have to maintain all of the linkages. Very, very precision tolerance to get a good feel out of this drive system. And it would have been dramatically improved if instead of a steady state gas pedal, if they had a foot gas pedal. Because this system, it's almost like you set it in a position and then it, it starts to slow down. I have another tractor that does that too, a hydrostatic one. And... You have to keep maintaining, like you have to keep holding on to the thing, and it just feels like it creeps lower and lower. And also the throttle controls on these, they don't tend to want to stay up. The throttle control on these things tends to kind of drift away. If you set it at full throttle, it kind of tends to just wind back down on its own from vibration or something. It would have been so much better to have a foot pedal because your foot is never busy. You're riding a tractor, you've always got feet available. It's the hands that are busy. Your, your hands are on the wheel. Your hands are on the mower deck. You don't have enough hands to run this machine. You've got to keep adjusting the throttle. You've got to keep adjusting the mower deck. You've got to keep it steering. And then you've got to keep adjusting the, the drive control. 
So I would really have rather see these get a foot pedal, which now over on this deer again, we're back at this deer and these are the same thing when you get them, they've got a hand control for travel and you just don't have enough hands on them when you start adding in hydraulics. So I converted this to a foot pedal swash plate, which, I mean, I know I got it all apart, but the pump has a cam linkage right here. And that, that little curve is where the roller runs for the swash plate. So when you push and pull that rod, it's all on a rock shaft. And this here was just linked in to connect that rock shaft. So I deleted the hand control and I went to a foot control. I would prefer the right foot, but this the deer machines have cutting brakes on the right hand side. The precision of freeing up your hands and having a foot that's always available for infinite forward and reverse, I can't tell you just how wonderful it is. And I cannot wait to have this machine back together because I've got a whole slew of attachments built for it. 2500 PSI hydraulic system, uh, dual H3 valves, one, one mounted here, one mounted here. So I've got six hydraulic circuits on it and you know my front end attachment does up down, side to side, curl, uh, power angle, and one more function for grapple. So that's a lot of motions for the various different attachments I've built. And you wouldn't be able to do it if it was just hand control. So foot control is, in my opinion, foot control is really, really where it's at. If you're not gonna have a foot travel control, you should have a foot throttle. So for you guys that are building junk, those of you that are subscribed to this channel or watching this channel because you're, you're junk men and you like projects, especially these cases, these case machines, they, they donate their axles all the time for articulated four wheel drive because they're powered by a hydraulic motor. That hydraulic motor just needs two hoses. You don't need any drive shaft, and these things have a high and low range, a high-low neutral, which is right in here. So the gearbox that is in the back, it has a, a sliding clutch and a gear that can switch it from a high range to neutral to low range. All you've got to do is have a pump and a control circuit to run your A and B ports into these motors. So they make a wonderful donor axle to make an articulated machine. And I wouldn't freaking worry about using these frames. I would sell the frame. Maybe if you like this, if you like the tin, I would cut the tin off, take the steps, take the cowl, take the hood. But I would build myself a C-channel frame. Standard three inch C-channel, four inch if you think you're really gonna be <clears throat> piling it on. If you're gonna, if you're gonna build a forwarder, a mini forwarder with a crane, and you're gonna be picking up 14 inch, 18 inch saw logs, I would build it out of four inch channel the taller the better with a big uh a big spread on your articulation joint the frames are not really thick enough to write home about and they've got enough modification that it just doesn't make sense to me it'd be cleaner and, and more efficient to just start with undrilled straight c channel which is heavier than this you know press brake flat plate channel that they've manufactured so I think that's enough yapping out of me. If you got a case cheap, good for you. They hold their value. They cost a bunch of money to buy. They cost even more to freaking own, maintain, and they're aggravating. Maybe this video will encourage you to cut your case up, sell off the parts you don't want, and build something that is going to be great forever. They take Chevy six lug wheels. Chevy and Toyota six lug wheels are fine. That's a six on five and a half bolt pattern. You could fit a 31 inch tire if you just rolled these fenders up a little bit. But great part stoner. Not a not a wonderful machine as it sits, especially after it's got 30 years of use. I'm sure they felt great rolling off the showroom floor. And you probably will never find a, a modern made machine that's as good as these today, but that's uh that goes without saying. Thanks for watching. God bless you and praise the Lord.